Welcome to the first level of this security series and we're going to start by covering the essentials, so wallet essentials. So when you're getting into the, the crypto space, uh, this is one of the first things you'll probably come across outside of using exchanges if you want to store your cryptocurrency safely or your digital assets safely. So I thought it'd be nice just to, to start off from the base level and we'll cover some, some basic things. And then as the video series progresses, we'll get into more and more of the detail and, and eventually cover the security methods for storing your seed phrases and backing up your, your wallets safely. If seed phrases and terminology like that doesn't mean much to you at the moment, that's fine, hang in there. We're going to cover all that as we go through the videos. All right, so firstly, what, what is a wallet? Well, really, a wallet is just a bit of software that we use to interact with digital assets. And I use the, I'm going to use very specific terminology because a lot of people think that's where you store your Bitcoin or store your Ethereum. And the reality is that's, that's not really true. A wallet to me is really just a software interface that allows you to interact with blockchains. So you never really store coins on your wallets. And on the screen here, you can see we've got a few different types of wallets. So we've got uh, what we'll call a, a, a software wallet that is installed on your desktop, but that can also be installed on a mobile device. So we'll refer to these type as just software wallets. Uh, on the total other end of the spectrum, we have hardware wallets. And we're going to drill down into the functions that these wallets perform and the similarities between a software wallet and a hardware wallet. So don't worry, we'll cover that. And, and then what we've got is a spectrum of all these other applications here where uh, this particular application here is one that allows you to interface with a hardware device. So the, the line between the word wallet gets a little bit blurred because you, in this instance, we need some software to interface with our hardware wallet. So it's a bit of a combination. Now, something like Exodus is by itself a standalone wallet, but it can also be used to interact with a Trezor device. So you can see the lines start to get pretty blurred but that's okay, we're gonna cover all of that. And then we have things like My Ether Wallet, which is similar to Exodus. It can be a standalone wallet, or it can be used to interact with both of these devices and many others. Then we've got MetaMask, which is also a software wallet. It happens to come in the form of a, an extension for a web browser. And more recently, I believe it has a mobile application as well. Uh, and it can be used as a standalone wallet or you can connect hardware devices to it as well. And over here, the last bit is really just uh, the native wallet for the Trezor device. So it's just a bit of software. It doesn't actually act as a wallet by itself. It is only just an interface to a, a hardware wallet. All right, let's progress a little bit further and understand exactly how these wallets work. Okay, and I've got storing coins in inverted commas up here because you never really store coins on a wallet. All a wallet is, is it holds what we call a, a private key. And this private key is part of a, a pair. So a public key and a private key are associated together. And this private key allows you to control a particular address, the public key, that holds an entry on the public blockchain ledger. So as you can see, we've got a ledger here and this, this could very well be like a Bitcoin ledger, the public Bitcoin blockchain, where we've got a list of um, people's names here and let's assume that each one of these represents a Bitcoin address. And all we're tracking on this ledger is a movement of some number of bitcoins from one place to another. That's all that the public ledger does. Now, in order to move the funds from Mary to John, someone who has the private key, which allows you to control Mary's 
public address, this public key, they have that, that private key in a wallet of theirs. And that enables them to, to submit a transaction to the network, asking to move some funds that they control to another public address. And by virtue of them having the private key which authorizes them to do that, the network will then take that transaction that's been requested and process that transaction and move the value from this address, so Mary's address, into John's address. Now, the interesting thing, just by the nature of what they are, public blockchains, everyone can see everyone else's address. Now, they don't know who owns that address by name, but they can see the actual address, so the characters that make up that address. And that's the public key side of things. So everyone can see all the public addresses on the, in this instance, Bitcoin blockchain. However, unless you have the private key that is associated to that public key, you can't control any of the balance that's stored on that ledger associated to that public key or address. So really that's what our wallets are doing, is they hold your private keys to be able to allow you to interact with these addresses on the public blockchain. Not only do they do that, they go one step further. So a wallet doesn't just hold one private key, it can hold many private keys. And the way that works is, so for every coin you have on your wallet, you will have a different address associated with that coin. So a wallet, whether it's software or hardware, will control a number of private keys. In fact, it will control private keys for every separate coin, as I mentioned, but also for every address associated with a coin as well. Okay, so if you don't understand how Bitcoin addressing works, then that may sound a little bit funny, but if in your wallet, you may have a balance of, in, in John's case, he may have 10 Bitcoin in his wallet, but that may be stored across multiple Bitcoin addresses. And without you knowing, your wallet is looking after all those addresses for you, and each one of those addresses has its own private key, and it's representing it to you in its interface as a single balance of 10 Bitcoin. But that may be held over a number of different Bitcoin addresses, but you only see it as a, a single balance. So what your wallet is actually doing is it's forming a chain of all of these private keys and storing them for you and controlling them for you. And we'll go into this further in a later a video, um, but that's the importance of a, a seed phrase in wallets. I don't want to delve into that too much now because we will cover that later. But for now, just understand that a wallet will actually hold multiple private keys and can hold multiple private keys for the same asset, so Bitcoin, for argument's sake. Okay, and so we said that a wallet holds your private keys and it can hold more than one, as we mentioned. So what's the difference between a hardware and a software wallet? Why would you choose one over the other? Let's have a look at that. So we'll start with a, a hardware wallet and then we'll work backwards. So a hardware device has an inbuilt security chip and that security chip is what allows us to generate these private keys and, and store that private key chain information. Now, in the case of a hardware wallet, that security chip is maintained in the hardware wallet and is never ever stored on the device you choose to plug your hardware device into, so your computer or your phone, something like that. So it separates the security chip, the security element from the piece of software you're using. So we, we use an interface to communicate with the hardware devices to bundle up a transaction, have that transaction signed by the security element on the hardware device and then broadcast that to the blockchain for processing. On the software wallet side, it's a little bit different. 
It too has these private keys and a chain of private keys that it stores on your behalf, but it stores it on the device that you're using. So the, the computer or the mobile phone, which can be a little bit of an issue and is maybe not, uh, it's arguably not as secure as using a hardware device. And the reason for that is, is there's just so many attack vectors on say a computer, for instance. So if someone's installed a bit of uh, software that's malicious, then that potentially gives someone access to their machine and hence access to any files that are being stored that may contain these private keys. So that's, that's why we like to have the hardware devices is it gives us that separation and means that our private keys or the, the key store is never stored on a computer. Uh, so I hope you can sort of appreciate the, the slight differences in the way they store this security information because those slight differences have a really big impact on your overall security. And the fact that if someone compromised your computer with a software wallet, they may be able to access your private key store or interact with your wallet. In the case of a hardware wallet, even if your computer was accessed, they would still need to be able to have access to the actual hardware device because that's where you actually do all the approving of the transactions. So it means that not only do they have to compromise your computer, they need to physically have something you have. Now that's all dependent on how you store your seed phrases as well. And that's what we're going to cover next because that's really important, not only for software wallets, but also for hardware wallets. Get that wrong and it doesn't matter what you're using, your funds can be compromised. So it's really important. And we're going to move on to seed phrases in the next video. So please check that out.